Hello, I'm Jonathan Harris, Research Fellow at Stranmellis, and in this video series I'm going to be helping to guide you through the specialist considerations that you're going to need to take regarding your dissertations or research projects this academic year. In this pandemic there's great uncertainty about a lot of things, particularly in education, so it's best to plan your projects in a way that minimises the risks involved. Teaching and learning is unashamedly social and people focused, so it's understandable that your first instinct is to carry out qualitative face-to-face -face research, whether that means observing or acting research in the classroom or focus groups and interviews um, with other people. Unfortunately, the COVID pandemic has made these kinds of methods inherently and unacceptably risky. Noel Purdy and I have already written some guidance that you should make sure to take a look at. And remember that your supervisors will be your first person port of call for advice. Whilst they're there to support you, however, a dissertation or research project is primarily an opportunity for you to work independently on a project. So it's an opportunity to be creative. And in this video, the first of three, I'm going to give an overview of the kinds of research you can undertake without any human contact whatsoever and point you in the direction of further resources that you can take a look at in your own time, if these interest you. Many of the options available for socially distanced research rely on removing human interaction altogether using secondary data. That is, data that's already been collected by someone else and made available to you. Thanks to the information age, there are more sources of secondary data available than ever before. These might include online open source data sets, like the UK Data Archive, the Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency website, and the Northern Ireland Department for Education repository. A second place you might want to look are historical archives, those dusty records and photographs available in the Public Records Office, for example, libraries, churches, and certain schools. A third place to look then are the schools themselves. Your placement school may agree to providing you with certain data relating to current or past pupils as long as it is anonymised and you have satisfied ethics requirements. Finally, a fourth place to look is grey literature. Publications, reports and policies produced by the, all kinds of organisations in the field of education. Check out the IOE's DERA repository. Just because it's out there doesn't mean that you won't need to think about how you will go about gathering your data. If you're searching an archive, including an online one, think about what search terms you'll need to use and how you will sort through large quantities of information to get to the really useful data. Ideally, you should be systematic in your approach to data collection, meaning that you have set out and justified your parameters before you begin. This reduces your personal bias and reduces the amount of work that you will need to do further down the line. So if you're limiting your study of autism in the mainstream media to the year 2007 and to only two newspapers, you should be able to explain why. If you're asking a school for some data, make sure you're absolutely clear on what it is you're asking for and consider how you can make your request. It needs to be at the right time and to the right person or people. Don't just fire an email away and expect that to be that. You will probably find yourself two months later with no reply, no data and no project. Schools do collect and use data in ways that are increasingly important to classroom and school practice. For example, tracking pupils progress and identifying pupils that may need extra support. This could be a great opportunity to approach a member of staff in your school who works a lot with data about your dissertation. They might have some ideas themselves on what you could look into and your work could end up being useful to them and to your school. The kind of data you are looking for depends to an extent on what you plan to do with it, so you'll need to have a think at this stage about what methods you will use to analyse the data once you have gathered it. This is often where students writing their dissertations come unstuck, imagining that analysis will require some specialist knowledge or software. However, analysis is best simply understood as your method of making sense of the data. It could be how you identify what data are important, for example, quotes, extracts, images, or how you choose to present that data in tables, graphs, text, image, numbers. And they're always affected by the theoretical approach that you're taking. Because of the variety of approaches taken within education, 
whether psychological, sociological, historical or philosophical, analysis will always look different depending on the project. The methods that you could use include descriptive and inferential statistics to find things like averages, ranges, probabilities and correlations. And there's a lot you can do here using Microsoft Excel. Or you might have some form of qualitative data, data analysis using coding to highlight key themes and contradictions within your data. Often some mix of the two, which is very common in education research, will be the best approach. You'll receive some guidance on this in your research methods module. So to give you a couple of examples, Haley might be interested in how children adapt to the use of new technologies in education. It's very topical. She might take a historical approach to this question and choose to study the documents in the past issues of educational reviews, like the Times Educational Supplement, from the first time that computers or data projectors were introduced in primary school classrooms in around the 1990s. She might compare the ways that this introduction was being thought about and reacted to by the teachers at the time with material from recent months contained in blog posts written by teachers about the experience of remote teaching during lockdown. Her comparative analysis might underline similarities and differences between then and now that help understand the impact of new technologies in the classroom. In a second example, Connor might be working in an inner city school that was recently refurbished or redecorated and wanting to investigate whether this has had any impact on school attendance and educational achievement. He might observe and make notes on the new layout and decoration of the school's classrooms, playgrounds and other learning spaces. Then consult a senior colleague in his school to see if he could have access to some current and historical data on pupil achievement and attendance, anonymised of course. He might also ask if there are any old photos of the building prior to the refurbishment. He might then run some basic statistical tests to determine whether there were any significant changes in the data before and after the refurbishment and suggest some reasons why based on his observations of the space and of the old photographs. Both of these examples would use two kinds of data and a process of analysis. Both would have something original to offer in the study of education. Neither would require any face-to-face -face interaction. Hopefully, this short video has demonstrated that there are plenty of ways of carrying out dissertation research without any interviews, focus groups or classroom observations at all. There's lots more useful detail in Gary Thomas's book, How to Do Your Research Project, available in the library. Of course, you may still wish to use what are normally face-to-face -face techniques um, as remote or online methods, using a video call to do interviews, for example. We'll be focusing on the ethical implications of doing this in the next video, before a final instalment on practical considerations.